We're going to talk about Levi and his calling today. And um, he was called to be one of the eyewitnesses. So he's a special place in God's heart and kingdom. Um, we're going to read his story today. But these Jesus stories, to me, are permission to be encouraged in our faith that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did, he will do. What he has done, he can continue to do. And, and, and not only that, but that's just who he is. We can get to know more and more who Jesus is by reading these stories. So we, we want to do that. Uh, and so I'm going to just invite you to look at uh, the second half of the paper there, uh, Mark chapter 2, verse number 13. And I'm going to read that for you. I know you can read, but let me read for you. He went out again. If you read the first 12 verses, you'll know that Jesus was having a problem. People were starting to follow him in such crowds, and there was such compa uh, compassion that was being released and healing and signs and wonders and deliverance that people were flocking to Jesus. And as they're flocking to Jesus, they're creating a crowd and a mess. On one occasion, they had to take the roof off just to get someone near to Jesus. So it was becoming a problem. But here's the other thing is, the more famous Jesus became, the more attention he got from the wrong people. They could be the religious crowd, they could be the skeptics, or the Romans. But in either case, crowd control became a problem. So in order to keep from you know, the Romans coming in and maybe breaking up the crowds, Jesus kept moving around. So after the healing of the young man, uh, where they took the roof off, um, the next thing that happens is Jesus decides, I'm leaving the city because, you know, they're going to just keep flocking the house. And so here we go. He went out again beside the sea. When you don't know what to do, go to the shore. I just, I think it's a good place to you know, heal. <laughs> if you don't know where to go, go to the shore. He went again beside the sea, which is actually a lake. It's called Galilee, the Lake of Galilee, or on most Bibles, the Lake of Tiberias. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi. Now listen to this. With two words, he changes Levi's life. I mean... There's a book that's called The Cost of Discipleship, written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German Lutheran pastor who went through World War II. He called out Hitler and the Nazis and um, eventually was arrested and uh, was, was killed at a firing squad Two week, in a firing squad, but two weeks before the Allied forces liberated Germany. And uh, so he died a martyr's death. He's written a book, and this whole book is on those two words. Follow me. I, I'm not going to top that. I'll tell you what, when I read the book, it changed my life. You might want to read it. Um, it was a long time ago, and I still remember the book. But as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of, it's Alphaeus, Alphaeus sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And there's no explanation for this. Levi just stands up. He rose up and he followed him. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus. And his disciples were there. Um, for there were many who followed him. If you read that closely, is there's tax collectors and sinners, and they all flock into Levi's house to this big party. And it says that there were many 
of the tax collectors, disciples, and sinners, you know, who followed, began to follow Jesus. And the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to the disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, and I know you know this, like you could probably almost repeat this, but this is, there's, there's two questions. In fact, let's just put the next slide up. There's two questions I want to ask. And like, the first question is, how does Jesus choose who he chooses? And the second one is, um, why? Why does Jesus choose who he chooses? I think those are fair questions. And uh, we're not getting into eternal security and eternal election and all that stuff right now. But I, I just, I just want to hear it again. There's going to be two verses or two phrases. I'm going to share the first one with you, and then the second one is in our text. Now, the phrase I'm about to share with you, you've heard Jesus say it before, but it was a common Jewish idiom. And Jesus snatched that phrase, and he took it, and he used it for his own purposes. And when Jesus said it, it meant something entirely different. Okay, so the first, the first idiom is this, many are called, but few are chosen. So how does he choose the few, right? And the second one is this, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I want you to just look at it again very closely here. Those who are well have no need of a physician. This is answering the question, why is Jesus eating with the wrong people? And Jesus said, well, first of all, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. And I don't know about you, but that just sounds wrong. Because I thought the whole goal was to be righteous, you know? I thought the reason that Israel was called by God and chosen by God was their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, heard God calling their name, heard God speak to them, and led them into a covenant and all you had to do to become chosen by God was to be born into Israel. Two or more grandparents, two or more grandparents, you are in. You are of Hebrew descent, and you belong to the nation of Israel. Can I just say this again? This is so... There, the, the, Personally, right now, the, the situation in Israel is so nuanced. It's so difficult. But never forget what Paul says uh, in Romans chapter 11. Number one is they're chosen because of their forefathers. They're not chosen because of their wonderful actions right now. They're chosen because of the faith of their forefathers. And the, and the second thing is there's a, a veil that lies over the eyes of the Jewish person, and they can't see Jesus just yet, you know. So our prayer needs to be um, really not that everybody would stand with Israel. That's like you certainly wouldn't want to ask people to pray that we wouldn't stand with them, you know, stand against them, right, you know. That's not the goal. The goal right now is to pray that the veil would come up and they would see Jesus so that they could respond to him and, and, and be introduced to the Messiah that God has chosen. You know. So um, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I get that. and We should do that. But this is really tearing the church up right now. It's like, where do we stand with Israel? Can I just say, we got their flag right there. Right next to it is Honduras. They're, they're hanging there between Israel and uh, uh, the Ukraine. Um, the wonderful thing is, and the good news is, that God sent his son 
and he created a new covenant which includes Jews and Gentiles, the whole world. So we want to answer this question like, what did Jesus mean when he says, I didn't come to call the righteous, which that would just include all of Israel. In, in Jesus' day, there's like, who's the righteous? It's, it's everybody in Israel. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. I want to look at that in a little bit here. But the reason is because Jesus is, he's connecting sinners being called and healing people becoming whole. So he mixes his metaphors. Uh, try it again. Those who are well have no need of a physician. I could argue with Jesus about that a little bit, but you know why, you know. So, so doctors really are for people who are sick, is what he's saying. Mm -hmm. So, this is really important that we understand that bec this because there is a connection between receiving Jesus, accepting him, and healing and wholeness. I know that every one of us right now have at least a little bit, something inside of us that says, if we could just elect the right president, things would be better. I'm just going to tell you that's probably not likely to happen, <laughs> given the two choices that we have. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just going out on a limb here and saying that I have lived through enough cycles to know that every time that the church was hoping if we just get the right person into office, it's going to change our country. Let me tell you something. That can be very disappointing. You know what would change our country? Is if people returned to the Lord. If people returned to Jesus. And I don't mean with lip service, but I mean with repentance. With repentance, prayer, and fasting. And then we began to get up from that and to follow Jesus that, that let me just back up and say this. My, my default thought is that not, it's, it's not, it's not if we just elected the right person. My default is like if we could just rebuild our families. If we could just really rebuild our families. And then if we could protect them that our world would be different. Well, just like electing the right person, we don't want to elect the wrong person. I mean, yeah, that's helpful. That's very good, you know. And rebuilding our families, that's, that's a great thing because a lot of hurt comes out of families. But better than that, if we would just say, actually... The gospel is the answer. The good news about Jesus Christ is still the answer. It's, it's, it's the answer for this country. In fact, it's the answer for every country. And I want to show you that as we go through this uh, scripture. And I only have 10 or 11 minutes. So we're going to have to do this really quick. We'll pick it up next time. But here we go. Number one. Jesus chooses Levi. Number two, Levi chooses Jesus. Number three, sinners choose Jesus. And number four, the righteous choose to question Jesus. So that's kind of the general theme of where we're headed here this morning. And then we want to make some 
some points in all of this. So the, the Jesus story that we just read can be outlined, first of all, with Jesus chooses Levi. Levi probably was not his name. Levi is probably his tribe. His name is Matthew, which generally means disciple. Okay, so I want you to think about this for a minute. You've got a guy whose his daddy's name is Alphaeus. Alphaeus is like where we get Alpha. It's the first, the first letter. So in this tribe of Levi, his daddy was first among his peers. And his son, Matthew, becomes a tax collector. It's, it's an insult. It's a travesty. He is literally a traitor to his country. Can you imagine if the Chinese invaded our country and took over every major city and then imposed taxes on us and there were Americans who were the intermediaries and received the taxes. Well, it, it's even more nuanced than that because in the case with the Romans, the Romans being Gentiles, they were literally outside of the covenant. They are unclean. So the problem was how do you tax people who, who not only can't stand you, but they won't talk to you. They, they won't come near you. They... They'll die first. Well, you get Jewish people to do it. They collect the taxes. And it was a head tax. I'm going to just use an arbitrary number. Let's just say that for every person, it's a yearly fee of 100 bucks. All right? Four people in your house, guess what? 400 bucks. Right? So the Romans didn't care about anything beyond the 400 bucks. So the tax collectors made their living by charging additional fees. So instead of it being $100 a person, it's now $150 a people. So now a family of four now has to cough up 600 bucks. How much would you like that man? There, there is something about, we just, well, we just hate taxes, period. I mean, we're Americans. <laughs> we got our country because we hated taxes up in Boston, you know. It was a little like that, you know. I mean, the, the British imposing their tax on us. So this man, his daddy is called first in the tribe of Levi. He's a significant man. And Matthew is called disciple, but he's not a disciple. He's a traitor. How'd that happen? What, what went wrong? How do you go from devout family of Christians and your son is now, you know, in the pagan's motorcycle club, you know, things like that. Like, how, how do you go from there to here? Can I just submit to you that even though the scriptures do not tell us this, that Matthew or Levi, if you want to call him that was a very broken man. You, okay, so he's opportunistic and he makes a lot of money. How many of you know that money cannot heal a broken heart? Material goods cannot restore what was missing. Can I just remind you that what is missing is connection with God and it started all the way back in the garden. You listen to the lie of the devil... You disobey God, and next thing you know, you lose your home and connection with God. Furthermore, God says, you're going to now suffer death and sickness, which is death on the installment plan. You know, incrementally, you die. Not 
instantly. We've got a number of shootings in our schools over the last few years, and again now this year. And you, you, you just ask yourself, how, how, does, how did we get here? And everybody has a, an answer for that, but I'm just going to tell you that we're, we're talking about people who are very broken. I'm not saying they're not guilty. Of course they are. But we live in a very broken world. So from the church's viewpoint, people are either lost or saved. But from Jesus' viewpoint, people are lost and broken. So he connects, all right, the doctor and the sick people, he connects that thought with the sinners and the righteous. So essentially what we have Jesus saying is, Levi, how do you like to be restored to wholeness? How do you like to be accepted back in the community? How would you like to be reconnected to your father? Or more than that, how would you like to know God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob through his son? I choose the healing. I choose the reconnection. He did. And the scriptures doesn't tell us this, but on other occasions, people had to leave their entire life behind. That's why that first slide, we could just go back to that for a second. That's why the table with all the coins and the change on it there, you know. Um, he got up and pushed back and he, he walked away from it. But he's also a very, very wealthy man. So with this new found, like Jesus just walks past and says, Follow me, which is the ultimate in grace, the ultimate in acceptance, the ultimate in forgiveness. Jesus himself is saying, come, come be part of my, my, my disciples. Now, I know that he's called to be an eyewitness. I know that he's called to be an apostle. But don't let that confuse you. When Jesus found him, when, where Jesus found him, he was... Just a broken man like so many others. And so, <laughs> Matthew, to his credit, he chooses Jesus. Th this is how chosenness works, by the way. Many are called, few are chosen. Who are the ones who are chosen? The ones who choose God's Son. If you don't believe that, just try rejecting God's son and see how close you get to God. No, this, this is Jesus. He is throwing out the seed far and wide. He's saying, I choose you, but will you choose me? And if you choose me, will you follow me? And if you follow me, will you go all the way? To the cross. By the way, water baptism is essentially that. We're saying to the world, I am choosing to follow Jesus, not only into the waters of baptism, but I'm willing to die for him. I am willing to stand here before you and to tell you that I have chosen to follow the Jesus way. Phil Wickham's words, you know. I have chosen to follow Jesus even if it means death, or walking away from all of this stuff, leaving it, pushing away, and pushing back on it. So, first of all, Jesus says, Levi, come follow me. Then Levi gets up and follows him. So, Jesus chooses Levi. And Levi 
to his credit, chooses Jesus. And he was right. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Everything you or I could ever possibly need in this life can be found in this room right now. In Jesus. Do you need wisdom? He's got that. You're facing cancer? He's got that. Marriage is a wreck. He can help you. Kids running away from God. He can help you. This is not just a dog and pony show. This is, this is central. Because I read in the Old Testament, in Psalm 119, that the way of the Torah, the way of the Word of God, is the way of life. And now Jesus is saying, you know, I am the Word. I am the Torah. And I am the way of life. Come follow me. So, Levi, he's got functioning brain cells. He says, I'll follow Jesus. He leaves it all behind. I don't know who took the money, but I know this uh, uh, Levi decides to throw a big party. Let me just finish with this by saying that, believe it or not, there were sinners who saw in Jesus a way of escape. They heard Levi's call, come and see a man. Come find Jesus. The scribes were invited. The Pharisees were invited. Everybody in town. By the way, the sinners in this story, it would be everybody who was pretty much rejected by the righteous. The person who commits abortion. The person who commits adultery. The person who's addicted and afflicted. The prostitutes, the Johns, those who sexted each other. Every, I'm, the ones, Jesus came for the ones that we typically want to get away from because we think that's the way of holiness. But you couldn't make Jesus unholy by being near sinners. So Jesus just opened up his heart and he welcomed them into Levi's house. So Jesus chose many of them. Some religious people decide to choose to question Jesus. I just just a bad choice. We're going to end here, and let me just say this. I don't mean it to be wrong. Jesus is both pro-choice and pro-life, not the way we think of it. He came to give us life and that more abundantly, but he sets before us life and death, and he says, choose life. Choose life. I just think this story is so profoundly beautiful because the people that I struggle with, the ones who are most difficult to get near because of their sin, are the very ones that Jesus accepted. 